Okay, hi everybody. Um, I am uh, Jackie Harris, so I am a, a child neurologist and neurodevelopmentalist at um, Kennedy Krieger and Johns Hopkins. And so um, Dr. Farner gave you the wonderful overview of the genetics and um, the clinical presentation of CAT6A. And I'm going to dive a little more in depth into the uh, neurologic and neurodevelopmental manifestations of CAT6A syndrome. So first we're going to talk about what we actually know so far about the uh, neurologic and neurodevelopmental manifestations in CAT6A syndrome. So uh, talk about some of the uh, hard neurologic things like brain malformations, hypertonia, seizures, and movement disorders, and then talk about the developmental presentation, including the uh, early on global developmental delay leading to intellectual disability, the speech and language, um, the behavioral problems, and sleep issues. And then we'll talk about what we still need to discover and where we go next. And um, sorry this slide is showing up weird, but um, so CAT6A syndrome has um, neurodevelopmental commonalities with other similar epigenetic disorders. So those disorders that Dr. Farner just showed you in the big wheel, there are overlaps there, but there are also features that are specific and unique to CAT6A syndrome. And when we're thinking about treating patients now and then hopefully treating patients in the future, we need to understand both of these. So we need to know where are the commonalities and how can we target those. And we also need to know what is very specific to CAT6A syndrome and how do we look at that. And so the common features are intellectual disability, hypotonia that is generally worse in infancy and improving with age. Um, frequently kids with these sorts of disorders or at least certain of these sorts of disorders have a happy, friendly disposition. And then sleep issues we're discovering now are more and more common in these syndromes. Um, features that are unique to CAT6A is um, the degree of language impairment in CAT6A, especially the expressive language and the speech impairment. Um, that the oral motor dysfunction associated with CAT6A tends to persist, so it may get a little better with time, but it doesn't completely go away or get to be less of a problem like it does in some of these other syndromes. Um, there's a much higher prevalence in CAT6A of craniosynostosis than in most of the other syndromes that we see, um, but there are actually fewer spine or vertebral abnormalities than we see in some of these other syndromes. and. Um, uh, so this is similar or, or different depending on what, which of these syndromes that you look at, but we'll, there are actually very low rates of, sorry, am I not loud enough? No, I, I, I need to share the screen. Oh, sorry. Um, all right, and um, something we're going to talk about is that compared to the degree of um, language problems and uh, cognitive problems that we see in CAT6A, the rates of behavior issues in this syndrome are actually incredibly low. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the skull malformations. Um, so craniosynostosis is... is uh, possibly in up to 10% of patients. This may be a little bit more frequent. Or, uh, we, we just It's hard to know when you have such low numbers of patients reported. There are no specific sutures that seem to be reported more than the others. Um, we still need more data to figure that out. Um, and then the other one is microcephaly. Um, this happens about a third of patients. It's more common in the, uh, all of the truncating mutations than it is in the missense mutations, and specifically more common in the late truncating mutations than the early. 
and um, the uh, spine malformations that are reported in a lot of these other disorders are actually very seldom reported in CAT 6A. So we worry a lot more about the, the head as far as the skeletal system than we do uh, about the vertebra. Um, and then we go a little bit inside the skull and think about the brain itself. So there have been many different minor malformations reported in patients with CAT 6A, including a thin or absent corpus callosum, which is the white matter that connects the two halves of the brain, um, some uh, a, a mega cisterna magna, so uh, fluid spaces being a little bit larger than you would expect, um, a, a low hanging brain, so it hangs a little bit lower into the vertebral canal, sometimes called a Chiari 1 malformation, and um, some other minor things. There are no significant common trends, and these malformations are relatively insignificant, meaning, for the most part, meaning we think that they are symptoms of CAT 6A, but not really giving us any clues as to how that patient versus another patient with CAT 6A would develop, learn, think, any of those things because we already we think that most of this is due to the CAT 6A protein loss itself and not really due to the brain malformations that may also result. Hypotonia. So hypotonia means low muscle tone. It uh, means that you know your child may be just a little bit floppier, especially as a baby. That their posture and their the way they hold their body is just not as uh, tight and strong as other kids or babies or adults. Um, it's reported in all types of mutations and in the uh, the majority of patients. It is the most common also in those late truncating uh, mutations. Um, and uh, it's a centrally mediated hypotonia. So we strongly believe that this is coming from the brain and the nerves running from the brain, not something in the muscles itself. So if you looked at the muscles, the muscles would most likely be fine, but the brain is mediating this lower tone of these muscles. It can be very significant in infancy, especially in those late truncating mutations. But as the kids get older, it's still present. It's generally not as impairing as their other <coughs> issues, but they often have clumsy or poor balance, even though most kids end up being able to walk and jump and things like that, although there are some who are still unable to do that. Um, physical therapy is very, very necessary, especially early on, and depending on the child may be very beneficial or necessary later too, um, and that is very child dependent. Seizures. Um, so seizures are definitely more common in CAT 6A than in the general population. Um, they are also more common than we previously thought they were in CAT 6A syndrome. So a, a very recent paper that came out looked at all of the literature and some new patients that they had collected, and they're reporting the prevalence of epilepsy to be about 20% in this population. So that is a big change from what we previously thought, which was less than 10%. Um, so it's still not a common feature, although it may also be underreported. Um, again, it's reported most commonly, interestingly, in the late truncating, like we've heard over and over again, but also in missense mutation. So it seems like in, for some reason that we may not understand, perhaps, again, that this could be just statistical skewing and not be the case, especially given the very few number of missense patients that we know about, but perhaps the early truncating mutations just have fewer seizures than everybody else for whatever reason. Um, there are multiple seizure types reported, um, and the most common are, um, uh, actually, uh, recently there have been a lot more kids with CAT 6A reported with a very uh, severe seizure type called infantile spasms, but the infantile spasms seem to be very, very responsive to typical treatments for that. Um, I, I say absence seizures in quotes because a lot of families will describe these as absence seizures. They're actually very rarely true absence seizures and what neurologists deem absence seizures. They're more likely what we call complex focal, which is sort of these staring spells that you see that you may have some eye deviation or other things, but not necessarily true absence seizures. And then focal seizures. So one part of the body having a, a seizure while the rest is, is able to continue functioning. 
Movement disorders are not thought to be common. A lot of patients have stereotypies or, or tics. Um, and uh, one study reported a patient with a significantly exaggerated startle response, although that patient actually went on to have seizures as well. So not clear that that really falls in the movement disorder category. And then neurodevelopmental issues. So this is the, generally the primary concern of key families with CAT 6A syndrome, especially post-infancy. Um, this is the primary area of um, where our group's research and clinical care is focused. Um, and so um, early development, so developmental milestones are generally universally delayed in CAT 6A syndrome. So uh, all streams of development tend to be later than uh, other children. Gross motor often catches up, um, but things like walking can be quite delayed. So, you know, many kids walk much, much later than three years. And a lot of times kids still have, like I said, balance and coordination issues, even though they're considered functional walkers. Um, fine motor is generally steadily behind throughout life. Uh, social emotional can actually sometimes be a strength. And then language we're going to discuss a little bit later, but that is the most profoundly affected. Children often look more delayed in early childhood than later. So um, we uh, generally, in very, very young children, kids with CAT 6A can look profoundly, profoundly impaired. And while they still uh, look extraordinarily uh, behind and have significant issues later in life, often we find that some skills outside of the language area, once they're old enough to be able to show us this, are not at all as severely affected as we thought they were. Um, early engagement with therapies through infants and toddlers or other mechanisms is very important. And the, uh, like many other things, the people with late truncating mutations seem to be the latest to meet their developmental milestones. Um, so language is affected in 100% of reported individuals. Um, and uh, most kids with CAT 6A have very profound language impairments. There are a few who have more mild language impairments, often involving pragmatics and things, but all have language impairments. Um, and it's much more affected than the nonverbal skills. The expressive is more effective than the receptive, although when we actually are able to test them, the receptive is also extremely impaired. Um, and so um, it's important to know uh, that the affected area here, when we're talking about the language delay, is both language, so the actual production of communication, and speech. So language is impaired in these kids even if you try to get around the speech. So there is a language problem and there is a speech problem. So both areas are working together to create issues in this condition. Um, and early investigation into assistive technology is very important. We're finding this out more and more in this condition and can help kids be more functional communicators um, when they're able to use a device. Intellectual disability is currently known to be present in all but one reported cases of CAT 6A. Um, the largest proportion of kids fall in the moderate to severe range if you go based on their IQ scores. Um, the missense seem to be the most mildly affected with the late truncating the most affected. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the, I, it's important to note that just pure full-scale IQ scores may not adequately reflect a child's functioning because of a discrepancy uh, between the verbal and the nonverbal. So um, Dr. Ang is going to talk about this more, but it's absolutely imperative to get good testing. Um, and uh, the other dimension when you're diagnosing somebody with intellectual disability, you look at IQ scores, but you also look at something called adaptive functioning, which is how are they able to function in their community. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Behavioral-wise, um, children are generally described as happy and social. Previous studies have reported that up to 40% of children have behavioral issues, but there wasn't specificity tied to that. So it's really not clear what behavioral issues could mean. That could mean anything from very profound behavioral concerns, like self-injurious behavior and aggression, to, you know, they're a bit hyperactive. It's, it's difficult to uh, assess that out without more information. About a quarter to a third have been diagnosed as autistic. Um, diagnosing someone with autism can be a little challenging or 
it can be easy to diagnose someone with autism, even if that's not the core issue in someone who has such low language skills. Um, and there's no clear genotype phenotype correlation with behaviors. And we did a little bit further looking into this. So um, remember, I was talking to you about that adaptive function, so that other area of intellectual disability besides the IQ score. And what we found is that even kids with, um, you know, with better IQ scores, with better cognitive uh, abilities, as far as their functioning in the community, it's pretty incredibly low across the board. And that probably has to do with the with two things, with the multiplicity of disabilities in CAT 6A, so the uh, hypotonia and fine motor issues combined with the cognitive and language issues, but it also is reflective of the incredible necess necessity in community settings of any kind in functional living and independence to be able to communicate, right? So if you have a profound deficit in communication, it is incredibly hard to be functional in, in the community without, even if your other skills may be strong. The other interesting thing that we found is when we look at maladaptive behaviors across the board. So both internalizing maladaptive behaviors and externalizing Kids with CAT 6A, despite their low adaptive function and their low communication skills, which are usually associated with higher rates of behaviors, they have incredibly low rates of behaviors. So they do not, they are not, you know, in aggregate, they're not even meeting the threshold for a borderline behavior problem. They're just really, really low rates of behavior kids, and that's a huge strain. Um, the other thing is sleep dysfunction. So it was previously reported in 30 to 40 percent of patients, and it was reported as both behavioral and obstructive sleep apnea being more common. Um, and it was, and it's been said that melatonin may be useful for sleep onset in some of these kids because sleep onset can be a big issue. Um, and so we looked at this a little bit as well. And what we found is that sleep issues are actually a much greater problem than um, 30 to 40 percent. So um, closer to uh, almost 80 percent have some sort of sleep problem. And interestingly, um, what we noticed is that uh, you all, you, uh, you guys actually report sleep being a problem lower than it is. So what I mean is you guys say, oh, sleep is not a big issue, but when we actually score the kids on what they're doing that you report as well, they are incredibly affected with sleep. And so that just shows that, you know, you all are pretty amazing and you're used to dealing with some pretty profound things. And so sometimes there's a problem that you all are out saying, ah, that's not much of a problem. But, you know, as clinicians, when we look at it, we say, oh, no, 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 that's not, that's not typical. That's not how kids are supposed to sleep. Um, so uh, where do we go from here? We need more research in every area. And we really need to understand more about the nonverbal cognitive profile, so outside of these profound language impairments, um, to uh, be able to build a bigger study to design some outcome measures for potential treatments, like Dr. Farner was talking about, that could be coming down the pipeline. And, um, you know, cognitive testing and sleep measures are going to be big areas of focus for these outcome measures because of what's primarily affected in CAT 6A. Um, and uh, Dr. Eng is going to talk to you uh, more about that. So um, I'm also happy to take any questions, although I know we need to move things along a little bit. So, um, uh, Emil, do you want me to stop share or keep sharing? I don't know if he's here. Yes. Are you saying maybe we don't have enough data yet, but a trend in how the kids do either in like their IQ scoring or in neuropsych assessments as they get older? So clearly when you do one uh, for early development, I would expect they score lowest there because yep. the development is delayed. But yep. do you see any improvement in general scoring as kids get older as skills come online? So data-wise, we don't have enough data to say that for sure. We're trying to get it, right? Um, but, it, like, from what we know clinically, the answer is yes, right? Because in infancy, the number of things we could test is so low, right, that the hypotonia, the low tone, 
and the language impairment gets in the way of everything else, so the kid looks like they can kind of do nothing across the board, right? And then as they get older, as the motor function improves and they're able to do more, and as the just the normal development of any child, their brain is able to do more things, and we are able to test things outside of the language domain, get around it, which we're less able to do in the youngest ages, that we see more strengths than we otherwise would have been able to. And again, not saying that there's going to be for the most part, there are not domains that are not affected, right? For the most part, kids with CAT 6A have very have difficulties across the board. It's just how, how much difficulty compared to what we had previously thought. Yes? Okay. So I'm going to talk about my kid, because that's what I know. Um, so Cora, my daughter, she's five, um, our geneticist at home told us, and I don't understand all of the little things about this, but uh, that she had a misspelling, like a mm -hmm. trivial misspelling, and then that her gene was also cut short. And she's pretty moderately affected, like she's not severe, she can walk and all of that stuff. Um, so I didn't know if that was something that you'd seen in the research, or if she's I, just weird. So without looking at your child's genetic testing report, I would be totally unable to speak on it, because that description is, is you know, I, we'd have, We'd have to look and say, you know, what we could we could talk offline and, and give you more specific information on that. We'd have to actually see the change that she has in CAT 6A. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what is the best age uh, to do? Um, Thank you very much. What is the best age to do a uh, cognitive test? Great question. Um, uh, we so generally we say we like to have subcognitive testing like in early school, like around you know five or six years old. That said, um, we will get back to you because we are trying to learn that as part of this now because we're not sure that in Cat 6A that five to six is going to be really a good time to do it. It may be a little bit later. So. I, I'm going to table that question a little bit. I would I would add on that it might it might depend on the experience and ability of the cognitive tester. Well, that is a very For example, good point. Like we, yes. we took our daughter Chloe to get a, a neuropsych assessment. Probably she's 14 now, maybe six years ago. Maybe she's eight, and we used a neuropsych assessor who is typically just experience with typical kids and so she was able to get through she was very adaptive and helpful but she used exams that were I think based for typical children if you will and so uh, it was meaningful it was productive I think but um I believe a, a neuropsych assessment from Rowena or at the Kennedy Creeker is going to be a lot more meaningful so the age you might want to do it might be less important than the specific clinic or assessor you use who has experience with which is a perfect segue for me to introduce Dr. Eng, who's our next speaker. So Dr. Eng is a uh, neuropsychologist at Kennedy Krieger and an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins, and she's going to talk to you a little bit more about neuropsych assessments in these kind of disorders, in kids with neurodevelopmental disabilities, and then a little bit about what we are specifically doing to try and answer your questions better in CAT 6A, because we have the same questions.